let's uh, talk a little bit about yourself, who you are, um, how you got into the business and, um, you know, a little bit about how, how long you've been writing and at what point did your writing begin to take off for you? I've been doing this professionally since 1997. Oh, and wow. yeah, I got into, I, I fell into the business, honestly. I uh, listened to this radio station, 92.3 The Beat, mm -hmm. John Lennon and the House Party in the mornings. And one day I thought, oh, I could do that. I could write those sketches. So I wrote one and faxed it to them. Uh -huh. And they called me and they said, look, we don't take outside writers, but this is funny. We'll pay you freelance. Right. And I thought, great. I made it. 50 bucks a sketch. Woohoo. You know. <laughs> and then I did one so offensive that my mother got mad. And I was really like, I'm on to something here. <laughs> But a month into it, Keenan Ivory Wayans called the radio station and wanted to know who did that sketch because he was looking for writers for his late night show. Oh, so wow. They, yeah. And that so, was in living color at the time? No, his uh, Keenan Ivory Wayans show. It was on oh, Fox. Oh, right. Okay. Late night show. Yes. Yeah. So uh, he, he called them and they told him and his executive producer called me in for, an, for a meeting and she said, okay, we need bumpers. We need monologue. We need this and that. I said, okay, wait, what's a bumper? Right. I had no Hollywood experience. My dream was to one day retire from Cal State Long Beach and write a book. Uh -huh. So she kind of told me. I left there. I got some newspapers and magazines um, to kind of get material for topical jokes. And, you know, I watched his show, which was premiering that night. And I wrote a bunch of stuff and faxed it back in. Because, yes, I'm that old. We still faxed. <laughs> she called me that Saturday and told me to get down there right away. So I was like, okay, fine. I just left the dentist. I need to change. No, come down here. I was like, okay. So I went down there. She put me in a room full of guys, about 14 guys. Uh -huh. And I didn't know they were the writers of the show. And they started giving me a hard time, but I gave it back because I had, I hung out with all my cousins who were guys and stuff. So it was no big deal to me. Right. Yeah. And then they moved us to this other room with this huge table. And I realized it was a writer's room. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that after Keenan walked in and I was like, oh, I'm not supposed to be here. And he saw me and he came over and introduced himself to me. And he was like, hi, I'm Keenan. I was like, I know. <laughs> and I was <laughs> tripping out because like he was gorgeous. Yeah. You know? <laughs> a bunch of movie stars and stuff. So I was like, oh, okay. Uh -huh. Um, so he went and sat down and the writers, what I thought were like telling stories, you know, like just funny stories, like your uncles kind of do when you sit around at a picnic or something. Right. Right. So when it was funny, I laughed when I wasn't, when it wasn't, I was just like shrug, like, okay, or whatever. What I didn't realize is they were pitching to him. Okay. So when it came yeah, when it came around this table to me, I realized he expected me to do that. And I was like, I can't pitch to Mr. In Living Color. Right. So I took the sketches that I faxed in. I was like, oh, this one's funny. And I slid it down the table. And you could hear all the guys just sucking their uh, breath like, she's not going to make it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Kenan, to his credit, he took the sketch and read it. And he said, you're right. This is funny. And he called on the next guy who stood up like he was in a Broadway play. And I thought, oh, that can't be good. Uh -huh. And by the end of the meeting, Keenan came over, shook my hand, said, welcome to the team. Wow. His line producer, yeah, his line producer came and got me and told me how much money I'd be making a week and the top of my head blew off. I thought he made a mistake. <laughs> by the end of the meeting, I had a desk and a computer and I called my mother and told her what happened. I called both my parents and my mother was on the phone and she said, Allison, what does he expect for you to do for that kind of money? I was like, Mama, let's be honest. I ain't too much out. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and that that was it. After that, he after the show, he called because he was rewriting Scary Movie, and he wanted me to be a part of that. And then we did wow. Scary Movie too, and it just kept going from there. Yeah, so I I can imagine that's like a whirlwind of. Uh of excitement and also it, it's it's also kind of like a cinderella story um where you know you you were kind of placed into this 
world and uh, you didn't know where it was going to take you. And from there, I'm sure it, it led you in, in various different directions until you got to this point. Yeah. Ignorance did me well because I didn't know how hard a late night show would be. Mm -hmm. So by the time I did my next gig, I was like, well, nothing is as hard as that. Like we had to turn over material every day. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like trial by fire. But it, and working with Keenan really prepared me for a comedy. So, so let's let's talk about that a little bit, because uh, writing comedy is not an easy task. Um, what are or were some of your inspirations uh, that you drew from uh, to bring the comedic factor uh, necessary to your storylines. Um, do you have do you have certain uh, inspirations, uh, certain people that that you look up to? Um, where do you draw your humor from uh, in writing? Because it's not easy to to write that way. I feel like I've been a writer my whole life. Like when I was like, when I was a kid, I told my mother I want to write when I grow up. Like that's the job I want to do. She's like, okay, fine, but learn how to type too. You know, <laughs> have right. a back. And I feel my earliest inspirations were my parents especially my father and his brothers they were always so funny to me mm -hmm. you know they reminded me of Richard Pryor and you know the good Bill Cosby we used to know right. and, the good Bill you know, Cosby <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, things like that but I was just always drawn to comedy and it was something I listened to and um Keenan told me I had a good ear for voices that I could pick it up that way. And just using my imagination has always led me there mm. um, and kept me in comedy. Because even in drama, I worked with David E. Kelly a couple times now. And I told him I, I really loved his work. I fanned out over his work. Mm -hmm. And if I ever did drama, it would have to be the way he does it because I would need some levity to it. I don't want to okay. just stay in a dark place. Right. You know, I don't want to just stay breaking hearts. Right. So, um, you know, I'm a sucker for happy endings. Would you consider yourself a structured writer or do you just uh, kind of put a uh, pen to paper or, you know, just start writing and just let your ideas come to you? No, I definitely believe in structure. Okay. I um, always start, well, I start with notes and ideas and put them down that way. That may develop into a pitch, but then that will eventually become an outline. Right. Because I, I need a roadmap because in the course of getting from the beginning to the end, sure, you can, you know, um, get off that map and go a different way. Something might take you somewhere else, but I know where I need to get back to. Mm -hmm. If the story is going to end this way, I know the road to there. And so I can have little distractions and a, a lot of other stuff is born while you're writing. Right. But I need that structure of an outline. And I always feel, in my opinion, I guess I, I know some writers who like, oh, I don't want an outline. And so you don't want right. to, but you probably should. The best writers do uh -huh. you know, in some form or another. They at least know the beginning, middle, and end. You know, okay. so that's always helped me. So you you wear so many hats in in this show. Act your age, um, such as the creator, the writer, the producer, um, and also the showrunner. Uh, if you had to choose, which part do you enjoy most, and why? Or was it the writing, the you know, the producing aspect, the showrunner? Um, can, could you explain that a little bit as far as what you do on the show? When you're the showrunner, you do all of that. I mean, okay. the creation, of course, came first, you know, and it's it's great when somebody likes an idea, you had enough to shoot it, produce it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they come in different steps, the, the writing, but show running covers it all. Once they say, we're going to do your show, my job starts. And if that's with um, hiring a staff, talking about production, talking about budgets, you know, interviewing wardrobe, all of that is happening while I'm writing a series. You okay. know, so you can't separate those. You mm -hmm. know, if you are uh, the showrunner, it starts and ends with you. So all the way through to editing and writing is always there. 
you know right that's um that's part of the reason why we're on strike because you don't ever all the way to editing you're always writing so i'd have to say honestly my favorite part is the whole damn thing uh, how, how do you how do you feel uh, as far as uh, representation of uh, people of color? Um, I know it's come a long way, um, but we still have quite a, a long ways to go uh, within the industry. Um, what is your take on um, uh, representation within the industry, and um, where do you where do you see it going? Do you see an improvement, or you know, uh, over the span of your career, have uh, have you seen any changes? and um, whether they're good or bad? And do you think we're headed in the right direction? I do think we're headed in the right direction. When I started, there were plenty of times where I was not only the only woman in the room, but I was the only black person in the room and mm -hmm. plenty of room. Mm -hmm. And that started to change. And I started to work with other women and we were like, oh my God, I've never met you before. I never met you either, you know? Right. It was, it was great. And then uh, more people of color and not just being in the room with more, more black people, but I think the biggest step is more black people show running and having their own shows. Cause a lot of black shows were run by white guys. Yes. Guys who were there before. Right. And you can always tell the difference. At least we can, mm -hmm. you know, even if the show is funny, we can sort of tell the difference. Like, Oh, y'all don't have any black people in the room. Right now, um, there not a ton, but there's been quite a few shows, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that have been successful with black people at the head. I think we need more than that. And I, I believe if the show is about us, it should be run by us. You know, that doesn't preclude me from having a show with a bunch of white people in it. <laughs> Right. You know, but <laughs> we need to be given those opportunities to fail like everyone Just as else. much. Yes, just as much. Just as much. Yes. You know, because they didn't make Shonda Rhimes show a black hospital. Right. You know, and that's a step up for us. Right. That kind of thing, knowing that we have a voice, original voices and stories is important. So, and I think that's for uh, every person of color. Mm-hmm because it makes the stories richer you know it makes what you're able to watch a lot richer and i know that it's improved although it can get better just in the difference from i was on the picket line in 2007 and 2008 and this time around the diversity is so good and so oh. rich and that's something we need to continue do you think at the end of the day that you know uh it, it, it will end in a positive um, and it'll, it'll work for the writers. I, I would hope so. But, um, you know, it, it looks like a lot of these studios are holding out. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I can't predict it. I can only hope. But I believe there will be some gains made for the writers. Mm -hmm. There always have been, even when we got to this point, we'll have certain gains. Now, will, will we get everything we want? No. Right. But I believe, you know, every three years we go through this. Mm -hmm. And every time somebody at some point has to compromise, you know, including the studios. Right. I believe we improve for the next generation. You know, I, I'd i love to be Pollyanna and say, oh, yeah, we'll get everything we want. It'll be great. That right. won't happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll make some improvements step by step. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll hope not to be placed with robots. We'll try to right. fight against now. So that's not a fight somebody has to do later. Yes. And, um, you know, I think we'll score on the big things. We have to. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I, I don't think um, AI is is the way to go here. I, I think um, you, you genuinely have to have uh, personality within the writing, the creativity and the art form of it all it should never go away, you know, just for the bottom dollar. AI has never had its heart broken. Right. It's never been worried about paying the light bill. Right. You know, it's never experienced sheer joy at having a child being born. Like those things you can't imitate. No, not and at all. And there's so many 
different things within that, the uh, minutia of it, the things you discover in a writer's room from other writers' experiences. Uh, as as far as writers rooms are, are concerned, I've never been in a writers room, um, but I've also heard about uh, many rooms. Um, or I guess there are smaller rooms where, where you know there's maybe like a handful of people. Um, have you been in um, a mini room, and what's the difference between being in a, a I guess a large writers room and a, a mini room? Because um, from what I read and what I take online, uh, they have like really quick turnarounds, um, and you know. Things don't always go their way. Sometimes once all the writing is done, the, the project may never even see the light of day. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's the biggest uh, part of many rooms because I've heard about several and some of them have, you know, eight to 10 writers, but the time period is so short. Right. And there's no way you can complete a project. I don't care if it's 10 episodes. Uh, you. It, it always tell producers, you know, do you want it fast or do you want it good? Right, right. Because there's a difference. And this whole writing process is layering. So I have been in one. Matter of fact, the one I was in, I wasn't, I didn't even know it was a mini room. I wasn't aware of mini rooms until I was in one. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, they catch people, they pay you minimums. But they tend to catch people, I noticed, when they weren't working or they were between jobs, because the more of these streaming shows that started to happen, people were unemployed at different times. Right. But it always leaves a showrunner in the end, especially if the show gets picked up, you know, writing or finishing those scripts on their own. Our writers like, no, I'll finish my draft and they're writing without being paid. Mm -hmm. So it short changes us, you know, we're making less money and spending more time. And they really, they, at, what we're asking for is guaranteed weeks. So it doesn't make, um, it makes the job worth it mm -hmm. and guaranteed minimums on staffing so that everybody doesn't have to work themselves to death. You know, if you gotcha. have 12 episodes, you have to have so many writers. Okay. But, it's a cool, oh. the, the worst part about it, though, is, well, two things I feel is to go through that process and then the show not even get picked up. Exactly. That's a lot of heart and soul you put into nothing. Yeah. And then two, um, the one I was in, the show hadn't been picked up. And I kind of felt like, so they hired us to help him break his story. Mm. <laughs> you know, they help. I'm like, that's something you usually do at home by yourself. Right. It's like, okay, I'm getting paid, whatever. But then uh, often the work that that mini room has done doesn't get seen on a show that gets picked up. It, it gets picked up and or by the time it gets picked up, everybody's off doing something else and they hire a whole new staff who then gets credit mm. for writing the show when it's yeah. been totally developed and broken by the room before. So it, it's a lot of sticky situations to it. Yeah, I can imagine that's, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I would feel <laughs> being placed in that type of uh, scenario, but I've I've heard many of stories that, um, you know, sound, sound pretty crazy like that. Um, and I didn't know that that happened um, it, with, within this industry. I, I figured, you know, once your show got picked up, and and you begin you began writing um you know they they made they may try to you know green light it and and air it but you know that's how i figured that's how some shows end up you know with one season and then you know they don't they don't move forward after that part of the the reason why i wanted to kind of give some of this insight um is because uh, i, I want to kind of bring a little bit of that to light for you know the audience and the people who will either read the story watch you know watch the interview um so on and so forth because i feel that it's important um to know and to also know you know where we're at and where it could potentially go um and you know hopefully nobody gets uh, placed in those um situations moving forward let's talk a little bit about act your age um how was the process um of Working with Tisha Campbell, uh, Yvette Nicole Brown, and Kim Whitley. How was that? Wonderful. <laughs> really I wonderful. Imagine. I can't. Um, 
And I, I did note that you're in the area where the show is set, the DMV. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, being being that you said it in the, in the DMV, have you been to this area? Um, what what drew you to this uh, region to to want to pinpoint that? I've only been there once, quite honestly. I've been to D.C. OK, uh, but it was the network. They wanted a show in this area. Oh, and okay. I kind of love that because I haven't seen too many lately there, but I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. But these three women have been on my bucket list forever. And I've known them through different experiences. I've always thought they were funny. Mm -hmm. When I tell you the appreciation I showed for them, they gave it right back. So working with them was, it was literally brilliant. It's the best experience with uh, talent that I've had. Really? Um, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. We're excited to do it. Look, there are three women who have always been the girlfriend, the assistant, the wife, and in Kim's case, the whore. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> right. <laughs> stories have never been about them. Right. These stories are about and for them. So they were appreciative of that. And, mm. you know, love was given, love was received. It was fantastic. Yeah, to that point, there's never really been a show about uh, three Black women um at you know in their in their 50s um that th there's no show that's been this way it's a it's either you know a, a family oriented show uh we've had like girlfriends and, and living single but nothing uh of this um dynamic so i thought that 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 was pretty interesting uh it's a pretty good take and uh a, a good angle to to go at and i'm i'm glad that you were able to to actually uh bring that to life because we need more stories like that, and and definitely um, women in their in their fifties definitely need representation on TV as well. Um, so I, That's I right. yeah, I, I definitely applaud that, and I'm I'm glad that you were able to uh, create a show that has um, those those aspects to it. Yeah, I'm so happy to be the one to do it because uh, it was it was long overdue. How did Bounce TV uh, approach you? You already kind of have uh, a spec script or you know a pilot ready to go. Um, how does that work? I honestly, this doesn't happen too often. And I did not have a pitch ready to go. Mm -hmm. I'd had some similar spec scripts that I've written before um, in this area, but uh, producer Brad Gardner, who was with MGM, I met with him first. And he said he liked my work and Bounce had this show. And if I was interested, um, they'd give me 16 episodes. And I'm like, yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> so then he set up a meeting with, um, I said, yeah, of course I'm interested. He set up a meeting with Bounce and Scripps Network, who owns Bounce. Mm, okay. And, um, David Hudson and JJ, I... I always want to say J.J. Abrams. It's not J.J. Abrams. <laughs> but <laughs> I met with them and they literally told me those are my requirements. These women, friends, 50s, DMV uh -huh. area had money. So I said, okay, I can do that. Right. And I went away and wrote a pitch um, and came back like a week later and pitched it to them. They loved it and said to go forth. And next thing I knew, uh, I had a show. I was going to ask, like, what is the timeline of your writing process? When you're writing, uh, you know, a, an episode, how long does that take you? Well, it, it varies because we start writing before the show airs. But usually a writer gets a week to go off and write a script that we've basically broken in the room. Okay. Um, sometimes they'll write their outline. Sometimes we'll just do the outline in the room. And then they get a week to go off and write the script. When okay. that comes back, we go over a pitch stuff for the episode. And then depending on how close we are to production, we have to get ready for a table read. Mm -hmm. And we do the table read, take notes on that, and then polish it up to go in production like the following week. It depends on when that table read was. It might be a week away. It might be three days away. We have to get it ready to be shot. So... You know, uh, that's why a lot of rooms start in June for like the fall season. Okay. So they can be scripts ahead of time. I see. But even when you do that, there's a certain amount of writing that has to go on while you're in production. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say as a showrunner, you never take off that hat. 
I see. And um, as far as uh, releasing new episodes now um, from from the first set of episodes, was that, uh, you know, giving time for for the writers um, to to have more um, episodes done? Or was, was that done on purpose uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, stretch out the span of the season? That was done to stretch out the season. We okay. had written and shot all 16 episodes before you even saw the first oh, one. Wow. Okay. And then you know, we had a little spring break. <laughs> Got and it. then they came, you know, so we can have some over the summer. So two okay. aired on Saturday, the first two. Yes. And they'll continue to air for the rest of the summer. So when when you're when you're uh in the process of of filming the show, um do you actually do you actually do any of the directing as well? Yeah, I haven't officially directed any episodes and I've been lucky um our first season to have great directors. So I haven't had to or I had the desire to because they have a job <laughs> yeah. you know on their own. But I work closely with all of them mm -hmm. and uh it's such a collaborative effort and a sharing of ideas that I love when I you know, work with somebody who, for one, you know, understands that, and how do I say this? In TV, the showrunner's in charge. In mm -hmm. movies, the director's in charge. Okay, I see. So, it, yeah, it's great when you get a director who understands that and who loves the collaboration. I sit down with all my directors uh before we start and just have a you got any questions kind of meeting mm -hmm. you know and for especially for a first season just establishing the tone of the show was important to me so again i had a bunch of great directors who were open to that and yeah if they've um rehearsed something um and i either want it different mm -hmm. or while i'm sitting there see something else I always try to go through the director first, uh -huh. you know, and see if they can translate it. If for some right. reason it doesn't still doesn't come across the way I like it, uh, you know, time is money. So I'll go straight to the actor and say, try this mm -hmm. or let's check this line to that. So, yeah, I'm always very involved because I have directed just not for this show. Mm -hmm. But I don't take away anything because this is multicam. I've never directed multicam right. to me it looks like juggling, you yeah. know, and I, I'm not good at that, but I, I do love somebody that I can collaborate with. So, so, uh, speaking of multicam, uh, from a director's standpoint, um, I know there's, um, you know, you have film crew, but, uh, the director is, is standing, standing, um, behind a, a panel and he's, he's actually looking at all, all three cameras and, and is he giving the direction as to, um, how that, you know, how, how it switches or that all comes in the editing? process uh no that's the ad who okay. does that um and the director is usually in the village with the rest of us they call it the village okay. you know and there are, there's a monitor there with all the cameras with the four angles of the four cameras so the director and the dp keep an eye on the ad i always get that mixed up ad DP. ad okay Assist, hey, assistant director is that what stands yes. that stands for okay yes. yes and they keep an eye on that and we had a great ad that was with us all year so, uh michael he was fantastic i'm i'm bad with the last names but it's okay he was fantastic so that's a relationship that's great too is because he can spot some stuff but he's keeping an eye on stuff that me or the director might not have seen and mm. can make suggestions for shots we had a a tricky episode um, that hasn't aired yet, where it was a game night. So it was a lot of players, a lot of little card tables and everything. Right. Um, and I wanted a certain setup, but the director kind of thought that would be too hard to do. So we just put our heads together and figured it out. And our AD was a big part of that, mm. you know, figuring out how we could shoot that, which would help us make our day. Right. So, and uh, the director got on board and we made everything work. And it's just important to have that. Um, I like a set with no egos. 
Right. You know, exactly. yes. I, I take mine at the door. I want everybody else to do the same. Right. And I want us to work together in that process. Right. In this business, I've had to run up against egos. Yeah. I've had to check my own, you know, I stop myself before I curse somebody out. <laughs> <laughs> so with actor age though, we were I, I don't know who heard me in heaven, but we, <laughs> <laughs> we had an ego list set and everybody wanted to make this work. You yeah, know, so that, yeah. that really helped. Yeah, I mean, because the, the, not only that, the, just the way the, the show is put together, um, the chemistry, everything seems to flow well. It doesn't seem like, you know, it's it's going to take some time to, you know, to develop or anything like that. So um, I thought that was pretty impressive. And um, I, I, I enjoyed the show. I, I think it's pretty funny. Um, I, I love Tisha Campbell. I love all all three of them, really. But uh, Tisha Campbell is one of my favorites. Um, and uh, Kim Whitley of course, from 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 Friday um, is yeah. definitely, definitely hilarious. Um, but I, I really like you know, the dynamic that you brought to the table with this. And um, we we need more shows like this, I think. I um, agree. And yeah. Thank you. I can't take full credit for the dynamic. These women have been friends for 30 years, so I kind of cheated. Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> I knew that they knew each other and supported right. each other. So it was great off the bat that we had that chemistry and they've been wanting to work with each other like this. Do you have any... Uh, upcoming projects outside of Act Your Age that you are developing. I know right now nobody is submitting anything due to the writer strike, um, but I'm sure, you know, you have you, you, you probably have a few tricks up your sleeve um, as far as upcoming shows um, or upcoming ideas that you might have. Um, do you have anything in the works outside of Act Your Age? I have an idea that's been nagging at me for years. And I woke up a few days ago and it was like, oh, you're going to write this. You Like it wouldn't go away. Mm -hmm. So I started, like I said, my note process, which I'll turn into an outline. Um, and, you know, actor age is my main priority right now. But I always, right. especially when we have downtime, like to write spec material. Right. You know, who knows? Maybe I can spin off shows or... The yeah. Norman Lear bounce, <laughs> you know, but this idea. <laughs> you never know. You never know. This idea. You never know. You never know. Um, like I said, it's been in my head for years. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It was kind of exhausting at first, picketing all day and then coming home to write. Right. And I'm just like groove back as far as creativity and things like that. So, yeah, by the time this is over, I'll have something else you know to present is is sick is like sitcoms are they like your your bread and butter or are you um open to doing other projects like uh you know tv series or or film comedy is my bread and butter you know okay. i've done um from <laughs> from radio to sketch to movies i've done comedy mm -hmm. and i've done one hour show uh, which wasn't, it was an hour, but not necessarily so dramatic, but big shot for Disney plus. Okay. And, um, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's that hour script. I was like, Oh, I'm still writing. You yes. Know? Yes. Um, so I would really have to have a story that I need to tell mm -hmm. to do that hour again. You know, I always do comedy, whether it's sitcom or single cam or, like, you know, I said movies and stuff, because that feels like a one off. Right. But a one hour series, I it's would really have to, to be compelled. Right. Yeah. Do you prefer to, to do all of the writing yourself or do you get it to a certain point and then you bring on a team of writers to to help? Or is this something that, um, you know, you pride yourself in, in writing each episode? Um, no, I'm a little OCD with my writing. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a little protective. So in the beginning, like for the pilot and stuff, I don't share it, you know, right. except for the people I have to, who are going to give me notes. I have one or two friends when I'm done, 
I may let them read it, you know, just to get an opinion. I let my daughter read a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. But then like, something we're taking a series like we did Act Your Age, I definitely have to have a staff, you right. know, right. Uh, for not only ideas, but to handle some of those drafts. Right Now, since it was a first season show, and I think this will always be me because, I'm, like I said, I'm OCD with it. Uh-huh. I make a last pass on every draft, even if okay. we table it and take it to the room. I still have to be alone with it and make a last pass. Mm-hmm. Writers understand that, though. You know, I I don't put my name on a script just because I helped to write it or did that last pass. Mm-hmm. It's still their script. Right. Usually a story they or a story I assign because I think they would be great for mm-hmm. this episode. So um yeah, I I because they bring you ideas that maybe you wouldn't have thought of it in this way. And I don't feel like I'm a creative genius where I'm going to think of everything. So right. I just polish it at the end because I know the show has to have a certain voice and tone. Mm-hmm. And it's another job of the showrunner. If you were to give advice to young and up and coming uh, and aspiring screenwriters, um, even filmmakers and, and, and actors, what advice would you give them um, if they're green and then also um, what, what advice would you give those that are, um, you know, kind of kind of already have a foot in the in the into the industry, but they're still trying to find their way. Um, and, and in particular, can you can you also uh, point out, you know, what it takes, um, especially being a person of color um, and, the, you know, some of the difficulties that we might have to go through to to be seen and heard and represented properly? I think starting with writers that you never stop writing. You know, you always have something ready and Hollywood is looking for your voice. Mm-hmm. So don't write what you've seen. You know, th- those are good guides. You know, the difference between now and when I was coming up is you can get a script off of the internet, you know, just to use for research, you know, just to see format and see how a story flows. Right. We continue to write. And then the second hardest part of that is sharing your work. Mm-hmm. But what I think is great now, I see these writers groups, which I, I encourage you to join, They table each other's scripts. So you get to hear it out loud, Mm -hmm. you know, which helps a lot, you know. And as a person of color, as a Black person, you can't give up. Because trust me, this is an ebb and flow business. You know, it'll be darker before the dawn. But Mm -hmm. the reason I'm still here is because I never quit. You know, I made a way to write some point and eventually you put enough history behind you that people call right as far as actors and filmmakers all the technology is there Mm -hmm. even without a GoFundMe, you got a phone in your hand and i know you've heard this before but it is true you don't have to make the big epic film but it's the small ones that resonate with people, the ones that relate to other people. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a film about you babysitting your nephew, you know, story is king for each and every one of these um, people you mentioned, writers, directors, actors, story is king. Know how to tell a story. Right. Do your research on that. And I hated homework in school. <laughs> My job is homework. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Not a nine to five gig. I'm always doing something in my head or taking notes about something. It is my life. We used to joke about people who said, I want to be a writer. We used to go, no, no, either you are a writer or you aren't. And it, it doesn't even sound like a joke now. It kind of sounds mean, but mm. it's the truth. If I wasn't doing this show, I'd still be writing. I'd still be creating stories. Right. So you really have to want it. You really have to want it. I, you know, and I think our life is hard. I think about actors who go to auditions and so much rejection. Yeah. I let that shit roll off your back. Right. Because it's coming for everybody. Mm-hmm. You just have 
to believe in yourself and your voice and be willing to learn. I don't know everything yet. I don't want to know everything yet. Right. Every time I learn something good, I use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you need a bag of tricks. Right. And it keeps things interesting. It keeps things exciting. You know, it keeps you going. Yes, indeed. Yeah. indeed. Yeah. Well, Allison, I, I truly, truly appreciate your time. Um, congratulations again on your new show. And uh, thank you for giving us insight on what it takes to be um, a screenwriter, uh, a showrunner, a creator, uh, an amazing person like yourself. Thank, Thank you. So you. Two things. Yes. Two things I want to say before we go. Sure. Watch Actor A on Bounce Saturdays at eight o'clock. Yes. <laughs> Always forget to do that. <laughs> and two, pay for Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> pay for Zoom. <laughs> it won't cut you off. Right. Um, you can talk all day long. <laughs> right. 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 I apologize for that. One and one last thing for yourself. Um, where can where can people find you? Can you can you plug your your social media for us. Oh, sure. It's my name on everything. Allison Faust at, um, or at Allison Faust on Instagram and Twitter. A-L-Y-S-O-N-F-O-U-S-E. <laughs> yes. And you're also on TikTok as well, I believe. I, I followed, at least I followed somebody oh, yeah. I, I think that's, that's you. <laughs> yeah, you know, that is me. I only post stuff for the show. Oops. Uh -huh. Uh, um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's my name on that too. My, like yes, my name is. numbers. Okay. Yes, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you again for your time. Um, I hope you have a great evening. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. You have a great night. Okay. Yeah. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.